Why did Warren make decisions to sell something when he was wrong? He was wrong in the airlines. He was wrong in IBM years ago. He makes mistakes and he moves on. And the answer is facts. John Maynard Keynes said, you know, when the facts change, I change. What do you do? Welcome to the Millennial Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Hotsko. And on today's episode, I'm joined by Robert Hegstrom. Robert, welcome to the show. Hi, Rebecca. Great to be with you. Robert, it's great to have you here. You were on the We Study Billionaires show back in July of 2021 with Trey, and I'm really excited to have you on our show today. Because I'm the new host of the show and we have some new listeners, I wanted to go back to the roots of where the Investors Podcast Network started which was founded on studying Warren Buffett's investment strategy. You've written multiple books on Warren Buffett, so I thought that you'd be the perfect guest to have on to just help remind us of the core investing principles that make great investors. Yeah, that sounds great. So to kick off today's conversation, I'm curious to know, after you've written multiple books on Warren Buffett over the years, what do you think makes Warren Buffett one of the greatest investors of all time? Well, I, I think I think it can be summarized uh, uh, very simply, and is that Warren has a, a totally different orientation to the stock market than what I observe. Ninety nine percent of the people do. By that, uh, I think too many people spend too much time trying to guess stock prices and what stock prices will do in the short term. And Warren doesn't think about the market in that way. He thinks about stock prices as being businesses, and he's more focused on what's going on with the business, the economics of the business. And the stock price is, is almost an afterthought. He just doesn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about markets, stock prices, sectors, things like that. He just wants to be a business owner and isolate some really great businesses for his portfolio. And that's where he spends uh, the vast majority of his time is being a business investor, not a stock picker. Would you say that you think that's one of the biggest mistakes you see newer investors make when trying to even just replicate someone else's strategy is that they do it with maybe a short term mindset? Well, Rebecca, it's, it's absolutely correct that, you know, the, the, the mindset of, of investors has shortened. Time is compressed. Turnover ratios are, have gone up. Holding periods. I was looking at a graph not too long ago. Holding periods in the 1960s for average investors was around seven years. That is, they would, they would buy and hold a stock on average for about seven years. Today, the holding period for average investors is four months. <laughs> so, so it's very clear that, that people are trading stock prices um, as a primary method uh, in the market, as opposed to being business owners who buy businesses and watch the stock price go up over time as a reflection of the growth of the intrinsic value of the business. And so Warren, Warren is in the latter camp. He's a business owner and he spends no time thinking about, you know, short term markets and short term stock prices. But it seems, Rebecca, the vast majority of investors today spend the vast majority of their time thinking about what's going on in the market, what's going to happen this week, next week, this quarter, next quarter, and not spending enough time thinking about what business they own. Uh, and I think that's the mistakes that that people make that makes it very difficult for them to generate decent returns in the market. I want to touch on his forever mentality with stocks in a bit. But first, I want to talk a bit about just to set the grounds for today's conversation on Warren Buffett's method to investing. So your first couple of books on Warren Buffett were largely focused on his method and his process. So I'm just wondering if you can share some of your biggest learnings from studying his process over the years. If you had to boil down the key characteristics of his method, what would they be? Well, the, the first two books, you know, it's, it's amazing. It was, uh, you know, almost over 25 years ago. So the very first book was The Warren Buffett Way, which came out in 94. And, and um, I had written it um, as a way in which to think about a process that I thought would work for our, for our investors at the time. And, and basically, I started learning from Warren Buffett in 1984 when I got in the business as a stockbroker and his methods 
and its processes really did resonate with me because I was a liberal arts major. I wasn't an accounting major, finance major. I basically uh, kind of fell into the investment business kind of backwards and went through training and, and, and a lot of stuff uh, wasn't making a lot of sense to me. But when I read the Berkshire Hathaway and reports, the lessons there seemed to really connect with me psychologically and emotionally. And and what he was doing at the time uh, was basically spending, if you read a Berkshire Hathaway and report, he was just basically talking about the business, the people that run the business. Well, first of all, what, what is the business? What are the products and services that they sell? What were the economics of the business? How much cash came out? What was the return on equity, return on capital? He talked about the management and, and how they allocated the capital. So it, it was a narrative if you will, of investing, Rebecca, that, that spoke to me in a way that, that looking at just balance sheets and income statements and numbers didn't strike a chord with me. So when we wrote the book, uh, we basically wrote the book with the idea of all of these principles. We ended up calling them tenants. All of the tenants that, that Warren Buffett had talked about over the years, we wanted to know if, in fact, those tenants in which he talked about in the annual reports, did they line up? with the companies that he owns. So we went back and looked at the very first investments, the Washington Post, Cap Cities. We went into Geico, we went into Coca-Cola, Disney, American Express, all of them, and looked at those companies and lo and behold, uh, found that they they did line up perfectly well with the way that he was talking about it in, in the end reports. And so we divided them into four categories, Rebecca. We talked about business tenants. We talked about financial tenants. We talked about management tenants, and we talked about market tenants or basically how to value the business. And so that became the template. And basically, that's all the Warren Buffett way was, was a template that allowed you to apply that to a universe of stocks, that if you did apply that, it would reduce those stocks down into a workable number that likely had a, a great number of them that would give you an above average return over the long term. So the first book was was all about how to think about stocks as businesses and, and think about what were the major tenants that you would look for in a business. And if those tenants were there, then you were upon a, a good investment opportunity. What I didn't talk about in the book, uh, Rebecca, was portfolio management. I think at, at that young age, uh, when I wrote the book, uh, I was just so concerned about getting thing, everything right about the stocks that I think in the portfolio management section, which was a paragraph, I said, oh, you know, he buys and holds stocks forever. He doesn't do a lot of trading. So the second book that I wrote on Warren Buffett was called The Warren Buffett Portfolio. It was the very first book on focused investing. Um, that's what Warren called it. You know, when I talked to him about the book and I guess it was 1998, you know, he said, Robert, we're just focus investors. We just focus on a few stocks. And I said, well, that's a great term. Um, said, do you mind if I use this for the book? And he said, well, there's nothing proprietary about the term focus. So go right ahead. So it was called, you know, the Warren Buffett portfolio, uh, the focus investing strategy or the focus portfolio strategies. Today, they call that high active share. The academicians call it high active share to the degree that your portfolio is different. Uh, and its weighting and its number of stocks uh, to the underlying index, you stand a much higher likelihood of outperforming the market if, and this is an important caveat, if you're a good stock picker. So if you're a good stock picker, uh, you don't want to own that many stocks. You just want to concentrate on your best bets. It, it, and Warren says, if you're, do, if you're a know-nothing investor, you don't know a lot about investing, then you want to have a broadly diversified portfolio you want to index. So it really was two parts. It was how to think about the individual stocks. And then once we had the individual stocks, you know, how do we think about them in portfolio management? So as a way to kind of wrap this up, after uh, I wrote the uh, Warren Buffett way, people would come on the uh, television networks and the cable news programs. And they said, oh, you know, we like to buy, uh, you know, businesses that are simple and understandable that have, you know, good, favorable long-term prospects. And I went, ah, business tenants, check. And, you know, we like companies that generate a lot of cash, earn high returns on capital, high, high profit margins. Oh, financial tenants, check. They got that part right. We want management that thinks independently, that's rational about how they allocate capital, check. They got the management part right. And then lastly, oh, we always buy it below intrinsic value. And I said, oh, that's, that's exactly the Warren Buffett way. This is perfect. Then I would look at their portfolio and they'd have 100 stocks in the portfolio and the turnover ratios was 100% per year. And I said, well... You're talking the talk of Warren Buffett, but you're not walking 
the part of Warren Buffett. So that is what led us to write the portfolio management book. So it really is, is two parts. It is thinking about stocks as businesses. Then if you're a business owner, how would you think about a collection of businesses? If you had great businesses, you wouldn't want to trade them all the time. If you had great businesses, you'd want to hang on to them because that's what's you know growing your net worth over time. So th those, are, those are kind of the two parts of the Warren Buffett approach, a stock selection approach and a portfolio management approach. That was a really great summary. There's lots I want to unpack there. The one thing that you mentioned about concentration versus diversification, I think was really interesting because Warren Buffett took a lot of concentrated bets during his career. However, on the other hand, as investors were often told to diversify. So I liked your explanation yeah. of who should diversify and who should take concentrated bets. But I'm just curious <laughs> to know, do you think that the concentration was key to his outsized returns in the long run? And can we get these outsized returns without taking more concentration? Well, and I think that's an excellent question. And, and I think you've, uh, you've kind of got the boundaries around it quite right. So. Let's go back. If you can actually analyze companies and you think about them as businesses, you understand the cash, you understand the return on capital, you understand the competitive advantage period, how long this uh, will last. You can actually do, you know, cash flow analysis and do dividend discount models, which are all, you know, by the time you're a freshman in college, you've got that stuff figured out. Um, if you can do that, then really it's in your best interest to own fewer stocks, not more stocks because you're basically concentrating your bets on those things that have the highest probability of generating you know, high returns over time. If you don't have that confidence or you don't have that insight about, um, about businesses and how to think about valuation and stuff like that, as, as Warren says, you're a know-nothing investor, then you want to diversify. Warren said there's nothing wrong with indexing. Um, you know, it, it, it actually outperforms the vast majority of active managers. And, and so there's nothing wrong with it. You've just got to align your portfolio with your skill set. And, and, and if you said, if you do have the skills to think about stocks as businesses and do good analysis, owning fewer stocks and holding them longer term is better than owning lots of stocks and turning them over. But if you don't know, you know, if you're not a good business analyst, you don't have that, that, that confidence level, then you certainly, um, you certainly want to broadly diversify. Now, having said that, Rebecca, I would tell you over my career of doing this, you know, I would talk about, you know, the, the, the tenants that Warren would use in investing. And I'd say, well, you know, if we go through this and I mean, do you want to invest in the kind of the Warren Buffett way? Do you want to invest in stocks as businesses? And I tell you to this day, I still have not met one person who I asked that question and they say, no, I don't want to do this. No, they say, yeah, this makes perfect sense. I want to invest like Warren Buffett. I want to think about stocks as businesses. And, and I want to, uh, you know, run my money exactly the same way. Let's get started. And the problem is about two months later, I get phone calls or have meetings and people are all disheveled because something else is going on in the market. Maybe, you know, what they own is not performing very well. Maybe oil stocks are going up or financials are doing this. Different parts of the market are always going up and down at different parts of the time. And somehow or another, they are so seduced uh, seduced into what's happening most recently, thinking that's what they should be doing, that they end up wanting to sell everything that they just bought to go buy something that has just gone up in price. And so that's where they get off the track. And that's where they end up uh, losing money, is chasing things that have gone up in price and selling things that go down in price. <laughs> Uh, because they want to be right all the time, and and that's the slippery that's the that's the slippery slope that people fall into a trap. So I could say to you, Rebecca, there are three parts. There's buying stocks as businesses. There's running portfolios as concentrated low turnover portfolios, and then there's a, a psychological part, a, a philosophical emotional part of being. Uh, uh, kind of disconnected from the stock market, that it's not your boss. <laughs> you know, the stock market is not your boss. It's just there for you to get quotes. And you can either agree or disagree, but at which time you let the stock market become the boss of you, uh, then the game is up. Uh, you're you're going to end up losing money over time. So that brought up a question. It's often said that if we want, like you said, when we're thinking of investing in terms of a business mentality, we want to be business owners. 
often we might go to what we know best. So a niche that we're kind of an expert in, maybe it's a field we've worked in, but then I guess the other, I can see an issue where then we could perhaps only invest in the same companies in one industry or sector. And then perhaps our portfolio becomes too concentrated in terms of a sector industry, because that's what we know. Maybe those are the businesses we best understand, but then is there anything that um, you would would recommend in terms of how to just stay in your niche, but then also diversify? No, that you, you brought up an extremely, extremely important part, which is, you know, let's say that, you know, you're in the uh, finance business, or let's make it even, maybe you're in the food business. So, you know, food stocks extremely well, and you understand, uh, you know, food processing, you understand the marketing of it and stuff like that. You don't want to put, as an investor, you don't want to put a hundred cents on the dollar in the food business. Um, you know, you want to be diversified, but how much diversification do you need? Well, you might put, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% in, in food stocks. And then you might put 10 to 20% in maybe entertainment, media, entertainment type stocks. And then another 10 to 20% in maybe finance or things like that. It, it would be important for you to kind of obviously know, understand what you're investing in. But let's think about Warren Buffett. So when in his most concentrated positions, I guess he had one third of his portfolio in Coca-Cola. That's a pretty big bet. Um, he had uh, big positions in media, Cap Cities and Washington Post were probably another 20, 30%. He had some finance stocks, American Express and Geico. So, you know, when we looked at the portfolios in the late eighties and early nineties, you know, he got up to about a dozen stocks, but they probably were in about, you know, four different sectors of the market. I think at one time, Warren said you need more, no more than 20 stocks um, as a way to do it. So if you think about 20 stocks, put 5% into 20 stocks, and you might have four or five sectors, um, that's plenty of diversification, plenty of diversification. Uh, and that will give you more protection than if you own one or two stocks and put 50% in each stock. So there, there is a happy medium between owning every sector and owning hundreds of stocks like an index fund does and owning one or two stocks, which would be highly risky, uh, owning 15 to 20 stocks in, in four different sectors. To me, if you've done the analysis and, and you're confident in what you're owning, that's plenty of diversification in my mind for somebody. But your point is well taken, which is don't get down just to one industry and don't get down just to one or two stocks. That, that's taking too much risk. That makes a lot of sense. So I want to go back to Warren Buffett's um, investment method and his forever mentality with stocks. So Buffett has a quote, if you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. He is known yeah. to have a very long time horizon and stick to his conviction. And I'm sure that these stocks have fluctuated a lot during his time horizon. So can you just speak a bit about the importance of these two things and how you think it contributed to his success? Well, what, what he's doing um, is he's compounding money. Uh, and people really, when they think about investing, don't really think about the mathematics of compounding. That is, let's say we own a stock, we bought it at, at a good value. It's slightly undervalued to fair value. And, it, and it's compounding its return on capital, let's just say 15%. Okay, 15% is okay. There's you know, stocks that do 20, 30, and 40. But a 15% return on invested capital doubles your money every five years. And you know that's a 15% average annual return, just in very simple math. Um, what he's trying to do is generate those types of returns by owning a company for five years that can generate a return on capital at 15%, because over time, the stock price will equate, as, as Ben Graham said, in the long run, it's a weighing machine. Stock prices end up calibrating to the economics of what you own. If, if Warren has Coca-Cola, it's generating a 15 to 20% return on capital. And he owns it for five years, he's doubled his money. If he owns it for 10 years, he's tripled his money. And, and that's the way that he thinks about it. Most people don't think about compounding their underlying value or their underlying intrinsic value, they think about the trading profits of what they're doing. And, and those trading profits, uh, you know, oft oftentimes the odds on them are no better than 50-50. And so you're winning half the time, you're losing half the time. And when you're doing all that trading, not to even mention cost and taxes and things like that, at the end of the day, you're not compounding money at a very high rate. So trading often 
with its wins and its losses and its expenses, uh, probably underperforms something that's compounding money at 15 to 20 percent per year or doubling every five years. So Warren thinks about compounding his intrinsic value, his net worth over five years at a 15 percent rate. And, and that works out swimmingly well if you have the patience to let it work out uh, because the compounding is a wonderful, wonderful um, wealth builder over time. But it's not going to show itself in the first three months or six months after you bought it. Uh, and you're seeing things on the market go up and they're going up 10 percent and 15 percent and 20. And I want to buy this and then I got to sell this to buy that. And you're doing all this buying and selling and buying and selling. And by the time you end up tabulating your wins and losses at the end of the year, you find out, that, you know, had you just left it alone in a year or two, you would have made a lot more money than all this frenetic activity of buying and selling over the time. So once again, a different orientation. Uh, I can't stress enough, Rebecca, that when he looks at the market, it's a totally, totally different viewpoint, orientation, thought process uh, than what most people do when they look at the stock market. So another notable thing that made Warren Buffett successful is that he stuck to his conviction. He was very self-reliant, even if the market was telling him he was wrong. But I guess on the flip side of that, there are going to be times when you are wrong about an investment. And I'm just wondering how should investors think about navigating this dilemma of sticking to their conviction or, and I guess risk maybe holding on to a losing stock for too long instead of coming to terms with the fact that maybe they were wrong about this one? Uh, wonderful, wonderful question. Um, yes, self-confidence is critical. Uh, for uh, for investment success, because you have to have a a sense of confidence that allows you to stay the course when the market may be heading in a different direction, or it's it's rewarding stocks that you don't own and you and you feel you know left out and stuff like that. So self confidence is huge. I, you know the Emersonian idea of self confidence is a is a bellwether of how Warren has been successful over the years. But as they say, self confidence or conviction or stubbornness um, can sometimes get you in trouble if and when you should be making different decisions, you should have sold something, but you held on it to because you felt that uh, you know you were smarter than everybody else or you, you weren't gonna be flushed out of it. Why, do, why did Warren uh, make decisions to sell something when he was wrong? He was wrong in the airlines. He was wrong in IBM years ago. He makes mistakes. And he moves on. And the answer is facts. When the facts change, as John Maynard Keynes said, you know, when the facts change, I change. What do you do? And, and what you have to look at is the underlying facts. If your thesis on why you own something was because the sales and the revenues and the cash were going to go up over three to five years, and you look at your track record here of the economics of your business, and it's not doing that, the facts have changed. And so then you have to make a decision. You know, am I wrong? Is the market wrong? Or is the market right and I'm wrong? And you really have to be honest with yourself that if the facts are overwhelmingly um, evident that your thesis now is wrong, you have to sell and move on. We're not going to be perfect. Warren Buffett is not perfect. None of the great investors uh, that we study are 100% perfect. They make mistakes. But what they do is uh, when they make a mistake, they admit it, they take the loss and they move on and they reallocate the capital again. So there's a difference between being stubborn um, and, and, and being uh, flexible in your thinking that when the facts change, uh, you've got to change your portfolio. So th there's a fine line between the two. That brings up uh, another question for me. So we often talk about um, Buffett successes, but and we try and learn from those. But I think it's also important to learn from mistakes. So can you talk a bit about um, some of his biggest mistakes and what we can learn from them? You kind of touched on it there, but I'd love to dive a bit deeper. Well, um, so, you know, with the airlines, you know, airlines were tricky when he bought them the first time around. Um, he didn't, um, you know, they weren't the kind of uh, industry sector that they became in the years later. So, there was a time where they basically began to sell seats on airlines below the cost of, 
uh, running the airline in order to generate cash flow to stay out of the doghouse. But if you do that over time, and you're eventually going to go out of business anyway. And when you sell something below the cost of production, you can only do that. It'll get cash in the door, but it's not going to last very long if it's below your, your cost of production. So in the first years, when he bought U.S. Air many, many years ago, uh, he thought this could be a really good business. But when management began to sell below the cost of production to generate cash flow to stay in business, that ended up being a very bad decision. And 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 when, when the math kind of added itself up, he knew he was in trouble and he had to sell and move on. Then later, the business consolidated into the big four. So you think about, you know, United Airlines, American Airlines, um, uh, Delta, and Southwest. Then the industry became kind of interesting. And it was kind of like the steel business had consolidated. And you kind of go back and, and study the steel business. Once it consolidates, you know, into three, four major players, uh, it can have a tendency to be a very, very profitable business. Now, what then became interesting is that he was a very big investor in the airlines and prior to the pandemic, significant investment. And when the pandemic hit, uh, he sold the stocks immediately. And that ended up being the wrong decision. But in hindsight, it actually was a thoughtful decision because at the time, he being, uh, Berkshire Hathaway being almost a half a trillion dollars and had $100 billion in cash, he felt that at the time that uh, when the pandemic hit and the airlines were about to go bankrupt because nobody was getting on airplanes, the government would turn to him as an owner and say, OK, you keep these businesses afloat. And he didn't want to be on the hook for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars to support these businesses that couldn't operate during a global pandemic. So he sold those businesses. The government eventually then uh, lent them money, uh, which has been paid back over time. And those stocks actually went to higher prices than they did when he sold them. So it's a tricky time, um, you know, when you go through these types of, of, of episodes in markets like we did with the global pandemic. And I can't say that he was wrong in making that decision, but it ended up being a decision that he made that, that cost him a lot of money. But I understand why he did that. He made mistakes on IBM. He bought IBM, um, I think, because he felt at the time not only was it generating a lot of cash, it was uh, increasing the dividends each and every year. They had a good solid business where they were running software programs for the states and for local governments. And these guys didn't like to change their software providers, but he missed uh, the evolution of the cloud computing and how that would undercut the business at IBM, and ultimately he had, he had to sell that business. So there are mistakes that are made. Uh, some of them are um, you know, ones that you didn't see. Some of them are ones that you should have seen that you didn't. Uh, but once again, let's go back. Uh, when you make a mistake, uh, admit it, move on. The problem is if you're stubborn in it and you're, you're so overly confident in it and unwilling to be flexible in your thinking, that's where you could end up losing lots and lots of more money. I'm not sure that was the best explanation you were looking for, but mistakes happen in investing. Better just to admit it and move on. But if you've done your work correctly and you have 10 stocks, maybe two don't work out, eight do. And, and of those eight, you do want to have the self-confidence while the facts are in your favor. They're in your favor. They're, the economics are producing what you thought they would produce. If the market's not rewarding it immediately, no need to sell if the facts still substantiate why you own it. And when the facts change, you got to go. If the facts don't change, hang in there. And that's, that's I think, is the key. I think that is what makes stock picking so hard is that you could buy a great company and things can still happen. And you also have to be right on the timing. So that brings up a question that I have. When an investor is picking stocks using a value investing approach, the whole idea is that they think it's undervalued to the current price. So you not only have to be right about the company, but also in the timing or the convergence of the current price to its intrinsic value. So how did Warren Buffett think about that convergence piece or the timing aspect of that? Because like we, like you just talked about, you can invest in a great company, but things can happen and the timing can be off. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to push back on you, Rebecca, just a little bit. One of my favorite sayings uh, from Warren Buffett is, um, um, I don't know time, I know price. And what he meant was that he knows when something is mispriced, he cannot predict with certainty when the market will correct that. 
Now, to you know, I would agree with you, Rebecca, that if you've got a mispriced security and your timing is really good, the payoff will come sooner, not later. But if you've got a mispriced security and you know it's mispriced, let's say it's undervalued by 50 percent, and you don't know that if you're going to get paid this month, next month, this quarter, next quarter, this year, next year, but you know you've got a double in, ahead of you. Does it really matter that uh, the market corrects it this month, next month, this quarter, next quarter, this year, next year? If you're absolutely certain that things are mispriced like that, knowing that you could compound at 15 percent, um, the timing of it becomes less critical than the fact that you're quite certain that something's undervalued. So, by example, uh, today, so I'm a growth investor. I, you know, my argument uh, was that I thought grow, that Warren Buffett was a great growth investor. He just understood valuation because if you go back and look at the companies that he bought in the late '80s and '90s, they were all growth stocks. Things like Cap Cities, things like um, Coca-Cola was a high multiple stock. Uh, you know, American Express was a high multiple stock. So I made the argument that I thought he was a great growth investor, but understood valuation. If we look at the market today, the sector that is down the most today is the growth sector. And particularly in the technology, if you look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ's down, you know, probably 25 percent. You know, we had a little bump, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the second half of June going into uh, July, August. And now NASDAQ's down 26 percent year to date. There are a lot of great quality growth stocks that are down in price today. Um, and, and they went down in price because the market began to sell long duration assets. When interest rates go up and interest rates have been going up as the Fed's resolve now is to is to break the back of inflation. And in order to do that, they have to raise rates to slow the economy, uh, to recalibrate supply and demand. So the market began to sell growth indiscriminately. Uh, it was just a one one track decision. Interest rates go up, sell growth stock. Growth stocks are long duration assets like long term bonds. They're worth less when interest rates go up. That's correct. They're worth less, but they're not worthless. And the market has priced many high quality growth companies um, down 50 percent, 60 percent. And without a doubt, um, and, you know, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that does fundamental analysis that the most mispriced part of the market right now is growth stocks. What they don't know is when interest rates will stop going up and when interest rates stop going up, then growth stocks will do better. We saw that in the second half of, of, of June when it was thought that interest rates had peaked and you just all of a sudden the best performing stocks over a six week period of time were growth stocks. So we know growth stocks, generally speaking, uh, in aggregate are the most mispriced part of the market. I simply don't know when they're going to start to go up, but I do know they're the most mispriced. So having a portfolio of high quality growth stocks today that are, that are easily down 50 percent that could double over the next three to five years will outperform the market, no doubt in my mind. The market will not go up 15% per year for the next five years. It just doesn't have the economic wherefore to do that in GDP and earnings and things like that. But the mispricing in the growth market is so severe right now, there's no doubt that is the uh, market of the highest excess returns going forward. I just don't know the timing. So, but I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, I've been doing this for 22 years. I've had periods where I look like a hero and periods that look like a goat. Uh, and it has most to do with the short term uh, predilections of the market, uh, not necessarily the economics of what I own. So that's a long winded answer for you, Rebecca, is that, yeah, if you get the timing right, good for you. But predicting the timing uh, is almost impossible. It's a coin flip. Uh, you're just better off positioning your portfolio in things that are mispriced things that are undervalued, and if you've got that part right and can double money over five years, um, you know, that's going to be a good rate of return for you and a good, sensible rate of return. And that will beat the S&P and probably beat the NASDAQ uh, you know, over the next uh, uh, several years, going up 15% per year will be a hell of a rate of return. And there are many stocks out there that can do that right now. I think that perfectly speaks to that forever mentality of stocks, which we just talked about in the previous one. So don't worry about what happens in the near term. If you weren't planning on holding it for five, 10 years, then maybe don't spend 10 minutes thinking of it. So I think another piece of it, a Buffett advice that I think is extremely useful for beginner investors is don't follow the crowd. 
Um, I think this one's especially important in the modern age where we are constantly consuming information. We're able to look up different people's opinions on forums, YouTube, podcasts. And I think yeah. sometimes it's hard to block out the noise of the crowd and not let it impact your own analysis or assessment of a stock. So can you speak a bit on this point and why Buffett stressed the best way to invest is to ignore the crowd and just focus on your own analysis and your own value? Yeah, that's a wonderful question as well. And, and there are a lot of parts to this, Rebecca. Um, you're right. You want to, you know, once again, independent thinking, right? You, you don't want to be beholden to the crowd, uh, that you're only right when the crowd is with you and you're wrong when the crowd is against you. As, as Bu Warren Buffett once said, you know, um, uh, polling does not replace thinking. Sometimes, you know, when the market goes up, uh, you're right to go with the market when the market's going up. Sometimes the market gets it right and you go with it. And there are other times it goes up and it shouldn't be going up or it's going down and it shouldn't be going down and you want to take the other side of that. But it has nothing to do with the polling or like you said, you know, listening to YouTube or listening to the prognosticators and jumping on a bandwagon because everybody tells you it's time to sell or things like that. You've got to make those decisions independently of what's going on. But you shouldn't just always fade what's working. If it's going down, uh, there could be opportunity for you like there is now in growth stocks. So, you know, for me, you know, I, I think there's a, a great bet to be made and things that people don't want to own. So I'm willing to take the other side of the trade. At the same time, you could argue things that are going up the most right now, uh, things like utilities, things like food stocks, things like energy are the most expensive part of the market. People are gravitating to that because it seems to be working right now when growth is not working. Uh, so I will fade that. I will fade that. I won't, I won't, you know, I'm not putting money there. Uh, we're not investing there. We don't think the future rates return very well. So let's fast forward to 2023. Interest rates have probably peaked. Inflation has definitely rolled over. Uh, the Fed is more probably inclined to cut rates than to raise rates. What's going to do the best there? Well, obviously the growth stocks. <laughs> The growth stocks that are down 50% um, that have the few, highest future rate of return are just waiting for that for that inflection point where interest rates aren't going to keep going up. Inflation is broke. Once inflation peaks and starts to move uh, down, interest rates will cap and start to move down. And then growth stocks will be the best performing sector. That's pretty simple to figure out. When that happens, I am not going to sell growth stocks in the first few months of a growth stock rally. Um, as long as they're undervalued, as long as they're still growing sales at high rates, earn high returns on invested capital, and is still undervalued, I'm very happy to hang on to stocks for multiple years. I have a 25 stock portfolio. I have 14 stocks in my portfolio that I've held for eight years. Uh, we've changed the weights at different times, but 14 stocks um, in that portfolio over eight years tells you, you know, I'm not doing a lot of buying and selling. I'll change the weights, but I'm not doing a lot of buying and selling. My, my average turnover ratio is 13%, which is close to an eight year average holding period. So there's times when you want to fade what the market is doing. There's sometimes you want to go along with it when it's going, but you don't know whether you're right or wrong unless you have the facts at hand. So polling doesn't replace thinking. Contrarianism is an interesting way to think about investing because it can set you up for opportunities, but sometimes the market's right. And uh, when it's going up, it should be going up. And when it's going down, it should be going down. But you won't know that if you don't do your own independent thinking. Really interesting to hear your take on that because I've heard a lot of investors and just people that I've watched recently say that um, utilities, energy, stocks, those defensive plays are in right now. But then to your point, there is um, there's a point where those are just overbought and now they're overpriced because everyone flooded into them. And so I guess investors always just have to be thinking really critical about is this, even if it was um, perhaps undervalued over the past 10 years, if everyone flooded into it and now the price is up 50%, maybe it is overpriced now. And so I think that was a really good point you made bringing that up. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a quick story that may help people. So, you know, we were managing money during the pandemic and, and being a growth manager, growth stocks did extremely well during 2020 because they were businesses that could continue to grow uh, many of technology, internet-based, which were doing extremely well. 
So I think we were up 38% in, in 2020. It was a you know, really great year for us. Um, and, and towards the end of the year, it became very clear to me that the growth stocks were becoming fully priced. Um, you know, we weren't selling growth stocks, but we weren't aggressively pounding the table saying everybody should jump in and buy growth. Now, at the beginning, during March, when the pandemic hit and the market fell out of bed, went down 40%, we definitely slammed the table and said growth is the most mispriced, get it. Well, by the end of 2020, growth had repriced. What had gone down the most that year were dividend-paying stocks, value stocks, dividend-paying stocks. And they had gone down in price because everybody was convinced that we, we had already had the worst recession since the Great Depression. And it was likely that if the pandemic didn't resolve itself, um, which it ultimately did, um, that we could potentially have another Great Depression. So what did people do? They just sold everything that had to do with dividend stocks because they felt these companies had no choice but to cut dividends in order to stay alive. At the end of 2020, I banged the table uh, and said, look, the most mispriced part of the market is not the growth market anymore. It is the dividend paying stocks. You could not give a dividend paying stock away in 2020. You could look at these high quality value stocks. You could look at them. They had dividend yields, four, five and six percent. Uh, they've been around for decades and decades. You know, they weren't growth stocks, but they were good, solid businesses. You could not give a dividend stock away. Two years later, what is the best performing category in the market? Value stocks. The S&P low ball high dividend index is the best performing sector in the market today with positive returns. Um, and so dividends have worked out swimmingly well over the last two years. But to your point, now they're their most expensive part of the market, just like growth stocks were at the end of 2020. So the thinking should be not that, oh, I should own these dividend value stocks uh, of, of utilities and foods and, and energy because they don't go down. And when the market goes down, they stay up and stuff like that. Well, that, that's yesterday's game. That's, that, that game's over. Uh, they should be looking at themselves and saying, what is the most mispriced part of the market? And I'm here to tell you the high quality growth market is the most mispriced part of the market. Nobody wants it. You could not give a growth stock away. Try to give Google away today, Amazon, you know, any of these stocks. Nobody wants to own these stocks. But there's, without a doubt, the most mispriced part of the market. So, you know, do I know when it's going to happen? No, but I know two years from now, these growth stocks are going to substantially outperform the value side of the market. Um, and we're very happy to own those stocks, uh, knowing that we'll get paid over the next couple of years. I just don't know if we'll get paid in the fourth quarter or sometime next year, but we're going to get paid and we'll do very well with it. So when you talk about the growth stocks, are you um, mostly ta referring to um, large cap like tech stocks that you think are the most drastically undervalued right now? Yeah, it's yeah, they are. It's you know, as what the Modrin is, um, um, a, he's a, a finance pro professor at NYU and, and considered to be the kind of the, the leading dean academic on valuation. And he, he had an interesting uh, interview the other day. He said, you know, old tech is probably the most mispriced part of the market. And I thought to myself, well, what is he talking about? Is he talking about Intel or IBM or Cisco's? In my mind, they are the old tech. But he was referring to old tech today as being Apple and Amazon and Google and many of those stocks. And the new growth, the new growth, or the new technology, you know, would be the Ubers and the Airbnbs and, and and things like that. And so he said, you know, the, the, the new tech is 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 not necessarily mispriced, but the old tech is mispriced. And he was referring to uh, the Googles and the Amazons and the, and the, you know Apples and things like that. He as a matter of fact, he said that Apple, rightly so, is probably. Uh, I, he said, I'd rather own Apple than Coca Cola today. So Coca-Cola has gone up with a dividend stock. It's been a safe stock to own over the last couple of years. He said, I'd rather own Apple than Google. Now, but he was also pointing out, which is true, that you know, Apple's probably the single greatest cash generating business in the history of capitalism. I think in the last 10 years, it's bought back over $500 billion worth of stock, which if you add that up, it's that's more stock than 494 companies in the S&P 500. So it's a wonderful, wonderful business. And as you know, Warren started buying it in 2016. We started buying it in 2014. We got to jump on it. Um, but it's a wonderful company. And today it is the most mispriced part of the market, not Coca-Cola. But everybody wants to own Coca-Cola. Why? Because Coca-Cola doesn't go down. 
and they don't want to own Apple. Why? Because Apple is down with Google and Amazon and everybody else. Though that part of the tech market, which is quality, these companies have been, you know, Apple's been around 20 some odd years. Amazon, you know, came to the market in 98. Google came to the market in 2002. These companies are two decades old now. They have hundreds of billions of dollars in cash on their balance sheets. They've got dominant positions in their industry. They grow sales at a double digit rate and nobody wants them. Why? Because they go down when interest rates go up. But, but the old tech, which is, you know, the Amazons, Googles, Apples, you know, that group, uh, I would put ServiceNow in there, Salesforce, guys like that, um, are, are, are the mispriced part of the market. The new tech, which are the companies that came out during 2020 and, and during the pandemic, some of that stuff, um, you know, probably still could correct a little bit. Now, you know, Uber will still be here 20 years from now. Airbnb will be here 20 years from now. But they're not as mispriced as the old tech guys are, uh, like the Googles. Uh, so it's an interesting way in which to think about it. I think often investors overcomplicate their investment process. As I mentioned, we're just constantly looking at all these different information sources. And a lot of the time it can just be noise in our investment process and doesn't really add any value. So recently we've had on a few guests talk about um, why paying attention to macroeconomic data matters for investing in your investment process. But Buffett took kind of an opposite stance to this. He didn't ignore it. Um, completely, but I kind of like to have both views on the show. So can you talk a bit about why Buffett didn't really like to include a lot of macroeconomic data in his investment analysis? Well, I, I, you, you've got it quite right. I think, you know, the, the saying that we have here is that we're macro aware, but macro agnostic. Um, so I, 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 I kind of want to understand what's going on in the economy. I want to understand what's going on with inflation as it impacts profit margins. I certainly want to understand what's going on in interest rates, as interest rates, as, as Warren said, are probably the single most important indicator of how to think about valuation because they're the anchor of how you think about dividend discount models. But but we're, we're macro agnostic when it comes to making decisions about our portfolio. Why? Well, if I've got a great business at a great price that earns high returns on invested capital, has a huge total addressable market, can do this for the next 10, 15, 20 years, do I really care? whether interest rates are going up or down, or the economy is growing slow or growing rapidly, uh, there's never a bad time to buy a great business at a good price. And oftentimes, you don't get great businesses at good price unless you're in a poor macro environment. So um, that's kind of a circular argument. Yes, I'm aware of what's going on in the economy. Yes, I know why growth stocks are going down. Yes, I know why interest rates are going up. Yes, I, I understand that. But it doesn't stop me if I see something that I like quite a lot and that I plan to own for the next three, five, 10 years, um, what's going on in the economy? And Warren's the same way. He said, I'm going to own these things for 10 years. You know, what, you know what, if I can get it and when the economy is decelerating or accelerating, it doesn't matter. If you look at all his purchases, he's been on both sides of the, of the macro uh, ledger, times when the economy is doing well and times when the economy is doing poor. When the market gives you good businesses, great businesses at good prices, you buy them. You don't wait for the economy to get better to buy them. You buy them. That's what you do. And, and, and so it's very important as a business owner, once again, put that business owner hat on. If someone said to you in the middle of a recession, hey, I've got a really great business. I'm going to give it to you at a very cheap price. Are you interested? A business owner said, yeah, I'm interested right now. Let's buy it. They don't wait for things to improve before they then say, okay, let's buy it. Because by then the stock price was already up and, 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 and you've got it. So we're macro aware of what's going on out there, but we're macro agnostic when it comes to making decisions in the portfolio. I, I hope that helps. That was really helpful. I think one thing I want to touch on that you mentioned there is how Buffett, how and when he assessed the price of a company and these price multiples in his investment process. So I think often investors get wrapped up in price and these multiples and they may rule out an investment before looking at the business fundamentals. The price you pay is obviously very important, but can you talk a bit about why this wasn't the first thing that Buffett focused on? Well, price is not value. I mean, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't, but you don't start with price. To, you, you start with what is it worth, then you look at the price. Uh, too many people, I think, look at the price, they see the price is going up and say, oh, it must be worth a lot, I should buy it. 
or the price is going down and oh, oh, that must be something wrong with that. I, I should sell it. Price is not value. Um, value is the discounted present value of the future cash flows uh, accentuated by the returns on invested capital. Companies that earn above the cost of capital that have cash flow are worth more than companies that earn below the cost of capital that have cash flow. So it's, it's kind of a dual dual mandate for you there to understand value. You understand what the value is first, and then you look at the stock price. And if there's a big enough gap there between what you own, uh, valued as a business owner would value it, and what the market is willing to sell it for you, there, there's your arbitrage. That's the excess returns that you make. So we never look at price first. As a matter of fact, you know, Warren and Ben Graham both said, I think investors would do extremely well if stock prices were only published maybe once a month. <laughs> if, you just, if you didn't look at them at all, they probably would help you out uh, extremely well. Uh, people are too, too focused on ever-changing stock prices as some indication of value. There are lots of reasons why stocks go up and down every day, every week, every month, every year that have nothing to do with value. I think I wrote this in the last book. Just think about all the different strategies that are in place in the market. Not all of them are business driven strategies like Warren Buffett and what we do. I mean, you know, there, there's arbitrage out there. There's there's options moving. There's people that make macro, there's people making macro bets on stocks right now. Uh, there, there's lots of reasons, quantitative strategies. There's a lots of reasons why stock prices go up and down that have nothing to do with business valuation. And when once you understand that there's a difference between business valuation and what stock prices are doing, and you and you find that moment when you can arbitrage that difference, that's where the big money is made. And then I, I'll give you one uh, one last off. And I don't know why we're still in this business of determining that value is, is based on price earnings ratio. There's nothing written in any academic textbook ever that says that price earnings ratios are value. They're not. <laughs> price earnings ratios are nothing more than the market's expectation for the stock. A high PE is a market telling you that they have high expectations. They have a lot of optimism about a company. A low PE is basically saying the market is very pessimistic about the outlook for this company. Whether it's undervalued or overvalued has nothing to do with price earnings multiple. It has everything to do with cash and return on invested capital. But today you will find people that says, oh, the stock is too expensive because the price earnings ratio is high. There's, there's no evidence whatsoever that price earnings ratio is value. So you, you've got to get that figured out too, right? And, and Warren wrote that in 1992 when he introduced John Burr Williams, the dividend discount model as being the moniker of value. He turned away from Ben Graham who had been preaching low PE investing for 60 years and said, nope, that's not it. No, it's a dividend discount model that John Burr Williams introduced in 1938, four years after Graham wrote security analysis. And he said, value has nothing to do with whether the PE is high, the price to book is high, there's no dividends or there are low price earnings and low price to book and high dividend yields. That has nothing to do with value. So if you're gonna be a value investor buying businesses, get off this PE wagon and, and do the actual work. Because if you ask a business owner, what is the most important thing as a business owner? They will tell you this, number one, how much cash is coming out of this? If, if I didn't have the stock market to worry about, right? And I wanted to buy the grocery store down the street or a, a gas station or a donut shop, I would ask that, how much money did you make this month? How much cash did you put in your pocket as the business owner? And then I would determine how much capital I have to put in to run it. And do I get a rate of return on that capital from my cash? It's better than what I could get if I put it in the savings account at the bank. And when you think about it from those terms, boy, then, then the market starts to make a lot of sense to you. And, and it makes even more sense when it behaves foolishly because the gap between what the market is pricing and what you understand as business value is so glaringly wide that, that you can fall out of bed and know exactly what you're supposed to do tomorrow. I think that was a really great reminder for all of us. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about what you're primarily looking at then when you're finding these companies to invest in, what kind of metrics or ratios are you paying most attention to if it isn't the price multiples? Yeah, it's cash. Um, you know, so what we'll do, you know, very, very simplistically stake, uh, you, we'll take, we'll take EPS, right? You know, the earnings of the company. Um, we will then uh, add back the non-cash charges. So, the, you know, in GAAP accounting, which is, GAAP is called generally accepted accounting principles. It's not saying divinely inspired accounting principles. It's just, these are generally accepted. 
you take your EPS and then you add back the non-cash charges. So in, in, in gap accounting, you, you reduce your earnings by the amount of amortization and depreciation. So we add those back, but then we subtract uh, maintenance capital expenditures, um, what is monies that we have to put back into the business to get the same rate of return, to get the same amount of cash. And we get what is what Warren calls its owner earnings, <clears throat> which is you know, the cash that the owner of the business can put in their pocket at the end of the year. Uh, so that's important. And then we, you know, we, we try to figure out how much capital is in the business. And then we get a percentage return uh, of that cash over the capital invested. So for us, we're looking for returns on capital better than 10%. Why 10%? Well, that's the opportunity cost for investing in the stock market. Average returns in the market over time are roughly 10%. So if I can't earn above 10% on my stock investments as a return on capital, my opportunity cost to lending money to the stock market, I'm not interested. Why would I lend money to the stock market to get a 5% rate of return or lend it to a company that gets a 5% rate of return when the average return in the market is 10? So we look at cash and then we look at its return on invested capital. If we get good cash and then we've got uh, returns on capital above our opportunity cost of capital, that, then, then I'm very interested. Then as a growth investor, um, the additive is sales growth, because once you earn above the cost of capital, sales growth then becomes um, uh, the, 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 the throttle for intrinsic value. The faster you grow, the faster you grow your intrinsic value. So once you earn above the cost of capital, it is how fast you can grow, then how long can you grow it? <laughs> and that gets into the competitive advantage period, that gets into the moat, what Warren talks about, how long can we earn those excess rates of return? And you begin to think about, can Amazon, uh, you know, as the world's largest uh, retail director, you know, distributor retail products, how long can it do this at these rates of return? It's the largest AWS cloud computing business. How long can it do it? How long can it earn these rates of return? And if that adds up to, they can do it for a long, rate, a long period of time at very high rates of return on capital, then it's like, okay, boy, this is really a great investment. Then you got to do the math. You do a dividend discount model and you discount those cash flows at 10%. You do a reasonable expectation of sales growth over five and 10 years. And you look at what the model says, something like this would be approximately worth, not perfectly worth, approximately what is it's worth. And then you look at the price and if there's a big enough gap between approximately what you think it's worth and the current price of what the market will sell it for, then that's your excess rate of return. And that's what we do. So for the discount rate, that is one of the single most important factors that can change your entire intrinsic model. So I'm curious to know, you mentioned 10% there. Is that kind of the hurdle rate that you use when in your investment process? Yeah, that's what we use. Now in modern portfolio theory, so everybody goes to business school and gets their degrees in finance and stuff like that. Modern portfolio theory tells you it's the risk rate of return plus the equity risk premium. Equity risk premium being the volatility of the market up and beyond the risk-free rate. And so, you know, people have a tendency to say, okay, um, you know, when interest rates were one and a half percent or even 1% like they were over the last couple of years and the equity risk premium was four, five, six percent uh, you add those two together, and maybe you were discounting cash flows at six percent. Well, we thought that that was that was uh, unreasonably low. That interest rates wouldn't stay that low forever, uh, so we kept discounting at ten. Today, uh, the uh, the discount rate now with the ten year today at three and a quarter, equity risk premium at four and a half five. You know, we're getting discounts at eight. You know, almost uh, 30, 40, 50 percent higher than what they were a year or two ago. And as those interest rates have moved up, you can see stock prices are, have moved down. We continue to discount at 10%. And, and, and some people say that's just too high based upon the interest rate market. I go, well, maybe so. But what I've done is built in a margin of safety, an additional buffer, which is if I'm wrong on interest rates and they keep going up or I'm wrong on stock market volatility and it goes higher, um, I still just think across the board, <laughs> discounting my cash flows at 10%, is the most conservative uh, manner in which to think about value, then whatever volatility and in the interest rates do in the interim between that, I don't have to fine tooth it. I don't have to thread the needle so tightly uh, that, 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 that we do. Uh, uh, so I don't discount at modern portfolio theory metrics. 
I discount at the market opportunity metrics. And the market has basically afforded investors a 10% rate of return. That's my opportunity cost. If I'm going to lend money to the stock market, I'm going to expect to get 10% back on my money. And that's our opportunity cost. And that's what we discount cash flows at. I think that was such a helpful explanation. I have done two levels of the CFA, so I know that they go into detail about <laughs> discount rates and it's based on what is the market giving you. But I like that approach so much more where it's like, what do you want to get from the market? And if it doesn't meet 10%, 15%, whatever your hurdle rate is, you shouldn't invest in it. Um, because I think that's kind of where a lot of investors get um, hung up on is what rate to use. Yeah, let me give, give you a little piece of advice. When, when it comes to answering that question, Rebecca, don't answer it the way that I did. <laughs> answer it the way the textbooks tell you to do it, because that's going to be the right answer for that test. <laughs> I, I, I got my CFA in 1992. I don't think I could even pass today's CFA <laughs> if you even asked me. There's so much on there that I go, I don't need to know this. <laughs> but as a business investor, you know, I, I know what I need to know, and, and that's what moves me. I think the CFA is a great, great uh designation to have. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there that you, that you need to know and need to demonstrate a working knowledge of. But there's some stuff that's not relative to being a business owner. And if you're going to be a business owner investor, not everybody's going to do this, but if you're going to be a business owner investor, there's some things that you'll pivot from uh, that, are, that are being taught at the CFA. But as long as you're taking the test, make sure you answer it the way they tell you to answer it. <laughs> exactly. I think it's really good advice that investing it should just be kind of simple and often if you um, take a lot of formal education it makes it you go into depth in a lot of these concepts but when you go to apply it sometimes simple is just almost better yeah, yeah i agree i agree but thank you so much for joining me today robert this was excellent i know that i learned a tremendous amount today before we close out the episode, where can the audience go to connect with you, learn more about you, and maybe yeah. pick up your books? Great. Well, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm, uh, I'm the chief investment officer of a money management business called Equity Compass. Uh, we're a wholly owned affiliate of Stiefel Financial. I've been here for eight years after working at Lake Mason for got almost 20 years and, and moved over here. So we have a website, www.equitycompass, all one word, dot com. And on there, you can you can read, uh, you know, some of my commentaries. You can look at my portfolio, Global Leaders Portfolio. Uh, as far as the book's concerned, you know, just go to amazon.com, look up Warren Buffett Way, look up Robert Hagstrom. There will be the list of books. We wrote a book called Investing the Last Global Art. Uh, which is now in its second edition, which is how to think about investing from a multidiscipline way of biology and philosophy and psychology and math and things like that, which has been very popular. So there are more books on there, uh, not just about Warren Buffett, but about philosophy and different things that you might find interesting. But uh, I've enjoyed it, Rebecca. You're a great, great interviewer. Um, thank you. You have great questions, well prepared. And I, I certainly wish you continued success. Thank you so much, Robert. <laughs> one of the big explanations for why local investing works. It's all about comparison. And that's what we do in our industry. We compare all the time. A bit of comparison is fine, but if you take it as a starting point of your investment procedure, then it becomes a normative thing and often a disappointing thing.